Mash podcast. I'm Matt Hetherington. I'm joined by Max Kogler, the CEO and co-founder of PingPod. Uh, should a lot of table tennis fans should know about PingPod now because it's spreading like wildfire, especially across the east coast of the US. It's an automated uh, table tennis pod. It's app controlled. You unlock it. You can basically use it around the clock. Um, it's become a really great innovation. Um, and of course, Max is also someone who's very enthusiastic about the sport, loves to play, um, great competitive player with some pretty mean shots from off way off the back of the table sometimes. Um, Max, great to have you with me. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate it. So this, this podcast, um, I think my, my kind of philosophy for this whole podcast is trying to find the best people to talk about particular topics. Um, the topic that I thought would be most apt for us to talk about is bridging the gap between recreational table tennis and pro table tennis. Um, that's kind of like, especially in the US, is a huge, um, kind of like undiscussed or unsolved problem um, in table tennis because you know you have these interviews and they're like, oh, you know, what's table tennis like in in the US? And you expect them to go, you know, it's great, everything's going fantastic. But actually, the answer is usually, well, as a recreational sport, it's huge. But on the professional side, it's, you know, it's a little bit stagnated. And there isn't really like a link between both. Um, but hopefully, PingPod can, can solve that up. Um, I'm going to start off in the beginning to talk about PingPod. Some people might not know about it because it's mainly in the US. Um, you launched in February 2020, which is right before the pandemic. Um, how long did you spend planning and going over, I mean, the execution for this project is not a, not an easy task. And, um, yeah, what was your, what was your planning stages, uh, the inspiration for, for PingPod and how did you feel like the pandemic impacted your launch? Um, cause I know obviously like for WTT, they launched right before the pandemic and it, and it really hurt them. Um, you know, having a sanitized private pod, not necessarily a bad thing at that time. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. Again, thanks for having me. I, I just want to say up front that um, I'm going to try to give a lot of shout outs to people today. So bear with me uh, Go for it. because, Go for it. you know, we, we, what we've built so far is really the product of a lot of people's blood, sweat and tears. And uh, I feel like I can represent uh, a little bit and, you know, tell the story. But, you know, there has been some seriously inspired hard work behind the scenes. So, um, again, just a, a little preamble here because um, there have been a lot, a lot of people involved. Yeah. So to your question, uh, planning and, you know, how it all came together, uh, we incorporated, incorporated in July 2019, uh, wrote a business plan, oh, wow. pitch deck, raised money, got an architect. I uh, got a I got a software developer. Uh, our first uh, software developer was actually Christine Cha. Uh, you probably know Christine. I she's know Christine. A, yeah. She's another aficionado. Yeah. She she was amazing to get us started off in the right direction. She was you know not just a developer but also a designer and you know UX UI all of that. We just got right mm -hmm. out of the gate with her. Uh, scoured the earth for locations. Yeah. You know, ultimately found a couple then. The one location that really we wanted to hone in on, we negotiated the lease. You can imagine, right? If you go to a landlord in 2019 and say, listen, uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to create a table tennis club and there's going to be nobody working there. Uh, and it's going to be inside of a building where you have a, you know, a bunch of condos upstairs. Um, most people were just kind of shaking their heads. It's like, wait a second, how's, how's that safe? How, you know, do you have any precedent? Do you, how's that going to work? Yeah. Right. So it takes a lot of convincing. And this one particular landlord took a, took a chance on us. Um, I also have to say that, you know, uh, between us three founders, our, Ernesto, David, and I, we, um, we had to put down sort of our personal money for guarantees, you know, in case it doesn't work or any security concerns and, mm. and whatnot. Um, you know, fast forward, we now have 17, 18 locations, depending if you count the ones in Miami that are opening up in the next couple of weeks. But 
we now have people kind of knocking in our doors and asking whether we could be part of their building, you know, particularly in condos, universities, you know, different places, mm -hmm. because it's such a cool amenity for the people that uh, are living there and, you know, for that particular block, let's say. So we've now become yeah. a draw and sort of the tables have turned a little bit, uh, pun intended. So, uh, so yeah, um, so we started on the Lower East Side and, um, you know, built the first pod. I, I, you know, Ernesto, David and I were on the ground, like laying flooring and making sure everything is sort of, you know, up to snuff. Um, and we wanted to build something that is really, really good for great players, but also draws in and bridges that gap. Um, mm. People that are not great players, I haven't been playing like, you know, are not at any USATT levels or anything like that, just casual folks that kind of enjoy the sport or enjoy it as, you know, recreational activity. And so um, there was a lot that went into it to kind of cater to all of that. Uh, and then we opened up, like you said, in Feb 2020, um, right into the pandemic, but it was pretty fast. I mean, not as fast as MLTT, but you know, we had to build it. We had to build a little bit too. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, that was sort of the, you know, the planning building and timeline for our first pod. And of course the pandemic came and we were forced to close down, but only for a few months. We opened back up again, I believe it was June, 2020. And you're hundred percent right, right. Because yeah. we have this kind of setup where there's no employees. Uh, of course we have people that come in regularly and, you know, we stop the fridges and, um, right. and, yeah. you know, clean and all of that and disinfect back in the day, but it was sort of the perfect business, um, that allow people to still come together during that time. And we've had a lot, a lot of feedback during that time, basically telling, you know, some of our customers wrote us personal emails thanking us you know some of them were to the to the extent it's like thank you for saving my life i was extremely depressed sitting at home not being able to go yeah. out or not being able to meet or yeah. do anything social so yeah. Uh, yeah yeah it was i remember i mean during i think in new jersey we had three months as well where it was like you know businesses were closed down and um yeah i ended up uh, I was living with Judy, Judy Hugh and Corey Ida, um, and they were, they had a place down in Florida and they were like, you know, this, we're just going to go down to Florida and this, hopefully this all blows over in a week or two. Um, they're like, are you going to come with us? And I was like, well, you know, like you're driving down because they take the dog with them. I was like, you know, it's two days on the way down, two days on the way back. It's like four days out of 14 already. I just bought a whole load of like food anticipating mayhem for the next couple of weeks. I was like, you know what, I'll stay here. Um, and I, I literally stayed in the house by myself for like three months. And as fortune would have it, they just replaced all the tables at the club because they just become a Yola club. Yeah. So all of the old tables were in their garage and I literally pushed my bed to the side in their like converted basement and, and put the table down and spent like the next month making tutorial videos. So for me, I can understand, like, if I didn't have the table tennis table there, I would have, I would have either come out of it very out of shape, um, which fortunately I didn't, um, or just totally like brain soup um, from playing video games all day, every day. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're exactly, you're lucky like that, right? Most people didn't have anything to do. Um, you know, mm. not just recreational, but also in the just city, like in the city area. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. you, you just could not mingle with anybody, you know, uh, social distancing and all of that. And table tennis is great for social distancing. You have a nine, you know, the table's nine feet yeah. Yeah, yeah. long, which is perfect. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I, I think, you know, in, in weird ways, we were lucky initially. And, and then, you know, as it kind of took off into the pandemic, and like you said, we all thought it, I, mean, I at least thought, God, this could definitely blow over and everybody's kind of alarmist and whatnot. But mm. in the end, it became a really, really long and painful thing. And uh, we were very well positioned for that because of, you know, our setup. Uh, and then we thought, it's like, oh, what happens when the pandemic is done, right? Like, is this still going to work, right? Um, yeah, we had like change. sort of the opposite idea. 
And, and lo and behold, there were, you know, a ton, a ton of people that were still staying at home during all this time. And so um, it's, you know, it's, I wouldn't say pandemic proof, but it, you know, we were set up and as, as best, as best we could, um, you know, in terms of you, you asked about inspiration, right? So uh, you also mentioned, I'm, I'm an avid player. I'm, you know, I'm, I have a lot of passion. I have less skill, but you know, what I, what I don't have in skill, I make up in uh, passion and running around like crazy from I can, behind. I can, at, I can attest to that for anyone <laughs> that doesn't know you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, you know, we're all, all three of our co-founders were all table tennis addicts. You know, we, we called mm-hmm. ourselves addicts. In fact, um, I don't know about if you know about this group. You know, I've been addicted to table tennis for a few years and I started playing at spin. Um, mm-hmm. And we had an awesome group there. We literally called ourselves Table Tennis TT Addicts, and it was a, it ended up being a Facebook group as well. And you know, we were scheduling, doing things. Um, you know, here's here's one of the shoutouts I got to do for my fellow addicts. You know, Gordon Ho. I don't know if you know Gordon. Brett Coven, Johnson Lee, Andy Goldstein, you know, Clements Wan, Miguel. All of those guys. I'm I'm surely forgetting a, a bunch. Uh, but these were just great guys. We used to meet, you know, all the time and. Um, and all of us had incredible passion. You know, spin is great. I mean, spin is a great place. Um, I think Ryan was talking about it as well in, in one of your podcasts. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, you know, but, but the one thing that happened there is there are a lot of distractions there from the actual game, right? And as all of us got a little better over time, you know, there's beers and mood lighting and, you know, not enough space and, and all of that kind of stuff for mm-hmm. sort of people that are a little bit more purist. And so yeah. I, um, I was talking to Ernesto Ebwin, um, and we started thinking about maybe building something to complement spin, right? Something that focuses on the game and the sport rather than the party. And, and I think most listeners will probably know who Ernesto is, but, you know, for those of you who don't, I mean, he's, he's, uh, yeah, an icon in, in table tennis, uh, in the U S and the Philippines, you know, six time Philippine national champion, former number one in the U S and, uh, most of all, I don't know if, um, Matt, you've ever kind of taken a lesson with him or have, haven't, I've seen him coach at tournaments you know, for me, he's like, he's literally the best coach I have ever had in any sport, uh, phenomenal, a uh, phenomenal person. And I, I remember when, when he coached me for the first time and that he knew everything about my game. He said, I know you do the no spin surf to the middle to set yourself up for the backhand, you know, but you gotta be able to, and I was like, how do you know this? Like you never seen me play. And he was coaching, you know, while I was playing three tables o- over back in the day. So anyway, I digress. Um, so maybe a little bit of the origin story, you know, Nesta ran this small pop-up club in the Upper East Side, and we got to talking to build something more substantial, like I said. And, um, mm. and then we started looking at real estate, uh, you know, 15,000, 20,000 square foot places, like big places. Um, and during that process, our real estate agent actually said, listen, there's another group that wants to do exactly the same thing. And they were using the same real estate agent. And so they said, they really want to meet you guys. And it turns out it was David Silberman and Chad, his cousin. (laughs) And they wanted to meet us. So we met and uh, David and Chad were very enthusiastic out of the gate about teaming up. And Ernesto and I, mostly me, I was not very keen because I felt like I had the business side covered. I had the passion covered. Ernesto had actual expertise in the right. sport. And, yeah, you, you know, already a, have, you've already got it. <laughs> exactly. And I was like, why would I, you know? And then David was just, is an extremely persistent guy. And in this process of he, his, him being persistent, he, um, you know, I learned a lot about, he's very eloquent, very well-spoken, very smart, um, very strategic and all of that. At one point he kind of just mm. broke us down. And I was like, okay, fine, fine. Let's just team up, right? Basically, I was like, okay, I, I can't take this anymore. And you, you know, I seem to be <laughs> smart enough. And uh, Chad ultimately ended up kind of staying, uh, staying at, at his job. He had a, a really good kind of setup. And um, by the way, Chad recently joined us, like four years later. So you know, welcome home, Chad. 
Um, nice. he, he, he just joined us a couple of months ago, which is awesome to kind of have the, the band back together. But David, Ernesto and I, um, essentially said, okay, we're going to do this together. And at one point, David came to us like a month later and said, listen, I have a better idea than building a big club. Um, let's call it ping pod. And li- this is literally how he pitched it to us. He said, okay, let's call it ping pod. Think about a network of autonomous table tennis pods. There are smaller locations, all are app controlled. You use technology to get in. You can stay open for 24 hours and you have it at a ground level uh, with windows so people can see in. You put some cool tech in there. You make it cool. You don't make it stodgy. You allow people to see how cool this sport is from the outside. And all the marketing is going to be done by people walking by. And that was his, his bit. And, and you guys and you guys executed it so well because I you know when I went to when I went to Brooklyn for the the launch you go out onto the corner and you just have this you know in the evening it's kind of like starting to get dark you have this big bright pink lit up ping pod and the whole front of it's glass and you can just see through the front it was so cool it's really like one of the coolest things that I've I've seen since I came to the US for table tennis yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I think it's both, right? It's that his vision was so clear, right? And and he had it basically all lined out in his head. And then, you know, my initial uh, response was, yeah, this is cool. This is really cool, but it's never going to work. You know, a ground floor space in Manhattan or in New York is just way too expensive. And his sure. answer was like, he whipped out a spreadsheet with 25 tabs. Right. He um, he he was a banker before. Um, and so I looked at the spreadsheet. First of all, one of the best spreadsheets that I've ever seen. I've seen plenty of them. I, you know, I <laughs> I, uh, I I I'm not proud of it, but spreadsheets used to be my thing. So uh, and I looked through the numbers. I was like, OK, where's the rent? It's like, yeah, I already called a couple of landlords. This is where we and he put all the economics in there. He modeled it out, you know, for 10 years, all of that stuff. And. I just like try to poke holes in it and I just couldn't um, <laughs> by eliminating the labor component or the vast majority of it. Like it made this mm. a really, really feasible business proposition and break evens for less than 20% of occupancy, right? Which is crazy to think that you don't, you don't have to fill this out of the gate to actually have unit economics be profitable. Yeah. And so I try to poke holes in it. And then we, you know, he pitched it to Ernesto after me. It was funny because uh, Ernesto immediately, you know, he, he didn't have my response. He was like, oh my God, this is the coolest thing ever. Let's do it. And, and that's kind of how we, you know, how we got started. And then of course, you know, we, we, uh, we incorporated, did all of that, that, the stuff that I told you before, and then um, got, got our first pod up and running in Feb 2020. Yeah, and and just kind of snowballed from there. I, I know it's it's been growing. I, I know the West Coast is definitely waiting for it. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was um, that kind of the gap, um, that gap between recreational and, and professional um, that I brought up in the beginning. Um, if you look at the number of competitive players in the US, um, like the memberships, they've kind of been stagnant for a long time. They've stayed pretty much the same. Um, and I think like the recent increase is not really an increase in competitive players. It's more of like, okay, those people are already competing. Let's make sure that they're members. Um, so I, f- I feel like ping pot is, is a really, really positive step in the right direction. Um, especially like now you've started having some small tournaments. I saw one, one tournament recently, I think it was last weekend in one of the pods which is like, that's like a big step forward Yeah. to put like a tournament where recreational people are going. Um, What are some of the important things that you feel, not just in your, your, you know, your position with ping pod, but also as a table tennis enthusiast and someone who's passionate about the sport that can help bridge that gap between, you know, getting recreational people, maybe not playing like high level competitive, but at least interested um, you know, maybe they actually go to some events or, you know, show up and, and support some, you know, putting some some bums in seats, I guess, for for some cool events. 
Yeah, I, I think this is a great question. And this is the, the question, like part of the impetus that we had initially is to get people to understand that, yeah, yes, it's a recreational activity. And uh, we, we use the expression of trying to get people um, to get, get them to go on a journey from ping pong to table tennis, right? Yes. And yeah, there's a lot of questions about what you call the sport. Um, people say as the rec, rec activity, it's ping pong. And as the sport, it's table tennis. And there is this care? kind of, I don't is care that, at all. That and, you care about? No, yeah, I, I don't really care don't at all. Care. Like, In fact, I do think that uh, calling, it, calling it ping pong is a little bit more open. It's a little bit less exclusive, right? And mm -hmm. I think that's part of the you know, whole thing with clubs, right? Clubs are sort of very exclusive to begin with. And, you know, we call us as ping pod, right? It's a play on that. It's supposed to be open and to people that actually look at it as the activity rather than the sport. But ultimately, mm -hmm. we want people to go on that journey, you know, to ultimately down the, down the line, if they are so inclined to get this healthy addiction. And, you know, the, the journey is... Basically, like you come to the pod, like you're hundred percent right. We are doing events, right? A lot of sort of community events, some of them for casual players, some of them super social. Um, and, and, you know, then sort of you catch the bug and you play with your buddies a little bit and you see that, you know, your friend knows how to play a little bit better and it bugs you a little bit. And then you're like, wait a second, yeah. there's a house. Okay. What? There's different house pedal. What, what's with this one? And this one has sponge and this one doesn't. What's the difference? You start getting interested in that. And then, you know, before you know it, people are starting to actually buy equipment, right? They'll buy a YOLO mm -hmm. paddle. Um, by the way, shout out to YOLO at this point. You know, I know we're, you know, on on, uh, on the YOLO sponsored podcast. Um, that's not why. Um, <laughs> you'll, a, as you know, we are, uh, we have a fantastic partnership. We're exclusive with YOLO, who um, is providing all of our equipment, including the tables, the rackets, all of that stuff. So as people go on this journey, they go from the house paddles and the pink pot paddles to, you know, YOLO equipment. And, uh, and then they get it um, at one point, you know, more and more spin and they get to understand how spin works. And then, you know, before you know it, they buy it, the racket and the sheets, you know, and the, glued them on and all of right, that. And we yeah, all yeah. know how that works, but you know, that's like 0.04% of people that play ping pong that do that. Um, and, and it's this huge funnel, right? And I think um, we just want to make it easy and accessible so that people can actually go on that journey. And at the pod, you could do everything, right? And we, yes. we're open, like you said, 24 hours in a lot of locations. We have a ton, a ton of dates that go there, you know, Thursday night, Friday night. A lot of people come for an hour to play a little bit in the private pod. You can turn on your music and, you know, there is definitely not uh, competitive. And it all, it all you, matters how I'm, people I'm want to be competitive. Yeah. Do you, when you were conceptualizing Ping Pod, did you... Did you feel like you there was a there was like a gap that you were filling? Did you? I mean, Ernesto obviously has been involved with his own clubs and with with other table tennis clubs before. But do you feel that there's like a sense of neglect from some professional clubs where they're not taking on that role of nurturing players? It just it's kind of things feel sometimes very transactional. Um, yeah. And yeah, there is that whole elitism of like you're a ping pong player. Do you really belong here? We don't call it ping pong. We're table tennis players. It's, That's it's, right. it's different. It's a totally different sport. People will say, yeah. um, where it's just like, okay, where do those players then go? If they can't go to like a, a lot of them are like a kind of more elite training centers. Yeah. I, I think you're hundred percent, hundred percent on point here, which is you have the two They basically you had this barbell, you had these super, serious clubs that, you know, you can, I, I have, I have so many stories about this. I, I don't know if you know, Th Thomas uh, Buza, he's one of the, uh, the guys in Sweden, uh, general secretary of Swedish Federation. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Really, really nice guy. But he told me this story once, like, he's like, listen, like this happens all over the world. He had a friend who wanted to play table tennis and he said to us like, oh yeah, go to this club. You know, she drove there, she went there, she opened the door and she walks in and they had, they're having league. Right. So it was league. Um, and the first thing people were, were saying to her is like, Shh, there's a league match going on. 
And then she goes, okay, uh, where do I get dressed? I go, oh, I'll get dressed over there. She comes out. She's like, no, you can't, you can't play with these rubber soles. You know, it's not a pop. Like she literally left. And this is a friend of one of the highest bunch, you know, uh, uh, people at the Swedish Federation. But this isn't just the problem for table tennis. Isn't just the problem for us. This is a problem of the club mm -hmm. system in general for racket sports, for the most place, uh, for the most part. Yeah. And, you know, and I mentioned this earlier, the word club itself, if you think about the word club, do you belong to this club, right? Club has this connotation of being exclusive. You're only there for the people who know what they're doing and you got to be in the in crowd and all of that. And that definitely is the case. And, and listen, I just want to make it super clear. I love all table tennis clubs. And I think in the U.S. Yeah. or on the East Coast, the ones, you know, Lily Yip and Westchester and Princeton. And I've been to all of them. I've been to most of them, not, not as many as Christine Cha, but, um, but, uh, I think she keeps a, a log. She and Philippe, she keep does. A log. I think, I think <laughs> yeah. they have been to like 200 now all over the world. But anyway, I, also side point, but, uh, I've been to a lot of them. I love it. And I think the owners there, I think we're, we have very, very luck. You know, we have very, very good owners generally that try to be inclusive as much as possible. But they're working within a system that is exclusive to begin with, right? So you have that on one side of the spectrum. The other side is spin and club like F and B concepts that are, that have the priority to be on the party, right? Or the beer pong, the frat situation, or like yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. it's it's always uh, it's always connected to drinking. And so there, we thought there was a real gap, exactly like you just noted were like, hey, this is for players who want to have good, clean fun. They can have fun all the way to real workout, right? Um, I mean, you know this, like the only thing I do is play table tennis and yeah, you know, so much, um, uh, and it keeps me in shape. And it, it's, it's, it's a crazy, really good sport to stay in shape because it you know, requires you to do everything. So much so that my, uh, that my wife, uh, she wanted to start. She's like, oh my God, it's so easy for you to work out. I was like, yeah, because it's fun. It is great. Yeah. I mean, yeah, because a lot of the time you're playing and you, you're you having fun and you don't realize, like, if you go into a gym and you burn that many calories, usually, you you know, you end up either you, either the endorphins kick in and you feel amazing or you walk out of there and you're like, oh, I feel like shit. Like, <laughs> you really yeah, yeah. feel like you've just exhausted yourself. But, yeah. you know, you, I think people are pleasantly surprised by how many calories you can burn just even from playing a recreational table tennis. That's right. I mean, and once you get up to the higher end, I mean, perfect example is I think 2015, yeah, 2015 summer. So after I moved to the U S from New Zealand, um, this would surprise a lot of people, but I actually used to be pretty skinny. <laughs> um, but after I moved to the U S obviously like everything's all you can eat and you work at the club until late, late evening and what's open or oh, Buffalo Wild Wings is open. It's like, you just end up going to Buffalo Wild Wings like four nights a week. Um, and so I just ended up in really terrible shape. Um, and in 2015 in the summer, I went to China and I was only in China for one month in the summer and I lost 35 pounds and I was literally just playing table tennis. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's okay. Yeah, trading trading in China is a different animal, but sure. you know the the point yeah. still stands. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, and so you're right. So what we wanted to do is kind of bridge that gap, and there was a big space in in the middle, I think. And you know the key there was we wanted to make it easy and accessible. So one of the things about having many locations is that it's much closer to everybody's home, right? The catchment area from which you're drawing yeah. is much smaller. You don't have to make it a destination. It's in your neighborhood, right? That was the idea. Make it so easy, you just walk downstairs. Easy also in terms of booking, right? With the booking system, just super straightforward, mm -hmm. nice flow, yeah. everything. Um, and then make it less stodgy, more fun, right? Less like, you know, sweaty, stodgy, you know, more fun, build community, community events, things like that. And then the other thing is just kind of make it cool. There hasn't been any real innovation in table tennis for a hundred plus agree. years, right? I agree. I, yeah. uh, you know, sure, they made the ball a little smaller and plastic and they made, you know, there's a cyber shape there, you know, there's some things going on, but like no real difference maker, right? 
And so yeah. what we yeah, wanted I mean, to you do know, is... like, <laughs> you yeah. know, when uh, the shape of a racket and the color of the rubber, if that's the biggest innovation that's come in <laughs> the last century, then you should really take a step back and look and think, man, we should really try and do something. <laughs> I mean, I, I fight with people at tournaments all the time about being able to wear a hat. You're not allowed to wear a hat because my my hair is all over the place. I can't wear a sweatband, et cetera. I mean, you probably, you know, it might have had it. I know you, I, I don't think I've seen you without a hat for, a, you know, for a long time. But um, but that's that. how this how that's how the exactly it's it's pretty stodgy. So in any case, so we want to make it cool and build technology to support the play. Right. And uh, and build in features like the replay, digital scoreboards, and things like yeah. that. So you go to a pod, you're like, wait, whoa, hey, hey, hey hang on a second, this is kind of cool. And um, and the technology isn't supposed to, you know, back in a, I mean, for the last 15 years or so since the advent of social media, um, you know, this is this is a rant, maybe a little bit of a rant, which is, you know, social media is, it, you know, works because it's been created to divide us. Right, because the more outrageous stuff you say, the more people are going to get right. passionate right. about your comment. Yeah. Right, so it's constantly pulling us apart, and I think we're polarized much more so now than ever before. And so we felt like to bring people together. I know it sounds really cheesy, but it's truly the mission of what we want to do: bring people together through technology. Right, hmm. but into real life is is absolutely key, and that's. Uh, that's where we can focus on the things that, you know, we, uh, we have in common, right? I don't know when I'm playing so-and-so, whether they're voted for whoever they're voted for. I don't care right. because we're exactly. playing table yeah. tennis, right? And this is what's getting lost with sort of the virtual world. Um, and so, you know, our, our uh, chief uh, strategy officer, Ben Borton, um, he coined this phrase. I also call him a chief blog officer. He's he's written a number of blogs on how we think about this. Um, Pingpot.com forward slash blog. Uh, check it out. But um, he coined this phrase like, use your phone to put down your phone. Right? Use your phone to make a reservation to find people to play with. And then you put it yeah, down I like that. for two hours like to play. That. That's so. perfect. Um, okay, well, I'm, you've kind of answered a little bit my next question already. So um, we're going to move through to what I call my break segments. Um, I'm sure you've seen some of them. Um, yeah, I've done some really fun ones in the last week. So this is actually the seventh podcast I've recorded this week. So everything's been oh like crammed. Yeah, it took me eight months to film my first seven. <laughs> now I'm seven in one week. Um, so what I've decided to do for you is, um, I call this one Hollywood act. I've been giving them, you know, really tacky names cause that's how it should be done. That's right. Um, and I have picked a bunch of, you know, ping pod sponsored or ping pod players. Um, and what you have to do is you have to give me the movie character that first comes to your mind when you think of these table tennis players. This is going to be, this is going to be great. I, I, this is my favorite part because I just love putting people on the spot. Oh, wow. Um, so the first movie characters you have to pick are for the Algeti brothers. Oh, my God. All three of them? Yeah. Okay. Can it be, uh, can it be a show, not just a movie? Yeah, yeah. I'll yeah, okay. I'll give you some I'll give you some breathing room. Some ladder. Okay, great. Um yeah. Okay. Have you uh have you seen uh This Is Us? The show This Is Us? That sounds it, familiar. I don't know if I've it's seen it. It's a great show. Here's here's the plot, real quick. Uh I don't know. Uh spoiler alert for those of you who want to see it, you know, they'll <laughs> listen to this. Um there is a family in the 70s, 80s, uh, these, this couple that uh, they are having triplets. And um, during birth, uh, one of the babies dies. 
and the sun's super sad. Sorry, but um, you know the Algetis are gonna watch this. I know, and be like, I'm what so the sorry. Hell? I'm so sorry. No, no, <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Which one no. of us is the dead one? No, 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 no. That's the thing. That's the thing. So they end up being twins, right? So they're twins. So okay. we know they're this twins, makes sense. right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, there is a baby that is being found uh, and brought to the hospital at the same time, and they end up adopting that baby. And they're all very different personalities, and yet they're all okay. doing amazing things. Um, I like, so I like, I, I like yeah. where it's ended up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. It was a little dangerous there. Uh, maybe we we gotta cut out some of that. Uh, no, but no, yeah, no, no, no. they uh, they. Uh, I, I gotta tell you one thing. Since we're talking about the algorithms, uh, I've watched them from afar for a long time, and they can be pretty hardcore at the tables. But I cannot, I, 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 I cannot express enough my gratitude of what they've brought to the pods. Um, mm. They're the nicest people. I've, I've had coaching lessons with Adar myself. And I remember I came late to one of the lessons or, or we stayed over or whatever. And I wanted to pay him a little extra. He wouldn't take it. He's like, no, it's my pleasure. Um, these, these guys, uh, you know, off the table, um, yeah, I was, I'm, I'm, you know, it, it just, you know, people do behave differently on and off the table. In any case, maybe oh, yeah, a bad yeah, example, yeah. but if I thought about the <laughs> twins and, you know, the other kid, and I hope they I haven't like seen it, it's hor- It's probably horrible for them. But. <laughs> All right. The next one is, because uh, you have some international flavor on your, uh, on your team. The next one's Liam Pitchford. I don't know Ooh. if you, you must have spent a little time with him. I mean, everyone yeah. knows Liam. Yeah. Liam Pitchford. Who would he be as a movie character? Oh my God. He's going to hate me for this. Do it. <laughs> um, I'll back you up, whatever yeah, it is. Yeah, you know, I got, I got I, you. I, I got just, you just from like, you know, being tall and British and all of that. Do you know, uh, do you know that? actor i you know i i'm horrible with actors names um he's a he's he's a really funny comedian oh god um i gotta look it up hang on a second uh, uh british what is he uh comedian is he like a stand-up uh, comic or like a comedy actor tall skinny both uh uh stephen merchant do you know him? Yes, I do. <laughs> and he is. He's going to kill you. <laughs> He's going to hate me. Yeah. <laughs> Just not his character. <laughs> you know? yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, my God. Yeah, maybe we, That's we, brilliant, maybe, though. This is great. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, it's a no, little, like little bit looks like. Now, I have to say, I, I'm uh, meeting um, Pitch. He He's incredibly hardworking. He's actually very, very shy. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know him as well. I don't really don't know him all that well, but he's not shy uh, around me at all. That's okay. Sure. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay, I played, I played football. I played football with him and, uh, uh, okay. generally speaking, uh, you know, soccer, I guess. Um, you know, I, I found Man, him he's shy. Okay. He's going to like that. He's going to like okay. that less than the Steven Merchant, if you call okay. it soccer. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. No, no, he's great. He's actually, uh, I think Table Dance England have recently started making some more content with him, like in the run up to the the Olympics. And it's just, I I really like it when he kind of turns the filters off and it's just like, this is what he's like. Um, Yeah. Because he's he's such a funny guy. And, you know, when he's being totally honest, I mean, WTT had him eating the durian in, uh, I think they were in Singapore and they had him eating the durian. And he, he, he just not having a bar of it he's like this is awful he's like i don't understand how people can eat this and i was like this is for me like as especially as someone who's particularly interested in content around table tennis i would love to see this all the time that's i mean that's why i do these breaks right. right. i love stuff like that oh my god um, they're gonna kill me yeah it's great yeah i like what you're doing now like from a strategical standpoint of <laughs> after you choose the movie character for them you're like now you know, having said that, this, these people are brilliant people. So you're kind of balancing the equation. Um, all right, I've got three more. The next one is Amy Wong. This one's going to be a, could be a tough one. 
Oh, wow. Hmm. Oh, man. But let me let me uh, think out loud here a little bit. Yeah. Uh, a Amy, to me, and you, I mean, you, 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 you coach her some, right? I mean, she, she grew up at, um, no, no, I didn't Corey, coach her. Corey she was like, Corey coaches her a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I used to play with her like in tournaments sometimes yeah. when she was a kid. Um, but I mean, okay, like she's Yola now, so I'm, I'm dealing with her a lot anyway, but yeah, yeah I know her very well. She is one of the most gifted players that I have ever seen. Just pure talent. Uh, yeah. wrist action, I, you know, and this is one of the things about table tennis where I, I think it's a little bit sad that when you see her play in person is a totally different thing, right? Because when you have the, the, the angle from above, you don't see what she's actually doing with her. I, I don't understand how that's even possible, how loose her wrist is and how, um, you know, how fast the action is. Um, I have to think about that one. I don't. Yeah, okay, there's do you really nobody that comes to, to mind. Yeah, we'll, so we'll circle back. I mean, she's incredibly um, like unshakable, and yet I know she cares a tremendous amount. It's just, uh, yeah, I wonder what people feel like when they play her, because she'll just start giggling when she's hitting like amazing, you know, smashes. Yeah, or um, even worse, just show you nothing at all. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely just... deadpan. Yeah, maybe she was it be a, rounders. A, rounders. That, was I was just gonna say movie? maybe a poker player. Yeah, maybe a poker player. Uh, uh, you know, Matt Damon uh, doesn't. Yeah, doesn't, Matt Damon from Rounders. Yeah, yeah. has nothing to do with Amy at all. Nothing but character wise. That's right. Yeah. All right, we can we can run with that. Um, the right. next one's Dang Chu. Oh man, he's so explosive, so crazy explosive. Uh, he's also very smart, by the way, uh, you know, mm. we, we ended up sponsoring him and, and talking to him because he contacted us and he wanted to get involved in the business. He heard about it and he just thought it was brilliant. And he's thinking about what's going to happen when I retire. Right. Mm. So he's, uh, he's a really good, uh, like he, he understood the business model from scratch. He's like, yeah. And we're talking about unit economics and all of that. I'm like, how, how do you even smart guy? And he yeah. saw it on, on, yeah, very smart guy. So I would maybe, um, you know, uh, have you seen suits? I'm sure you heard, heard about suits. I have. Yeah. I've, I've maybe seen one or two, but not. So there's a guy in there. Um, that's very smart. I got to look up what, what his name is. Um, suits. Um, yeah, Patrick Adams, he's the actor. He plays Michael Ross and, okay. uh, Michael Ross, just really brilliant. I, I, I think, I mean, again, like, you know, not, they don't look alike. Let's just say that. And I'm sorry about but the essence, white guys. It's the essence, I, the essence of the character. That's right. I apologize for picking white guys. Uh, but, uh, yeah, the <laughs> essence of the character, very smart. He like he, uh, I'm, I was very impressed by him and yeah, of course his game is just, uh, we'll just say absolutely. that we're doing a promotion for a recast, <laughs> right? Perfect. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Here. yeah. We think that these players should replace the actors. Okay. And then the last one is, uh, is Lily, Lily Chung. Oh man. Okay. Lily, I think she's inc she has incredible presence. She's very, like people around her when she, you know, enters a room, I know this has probably been said about a lot of people, but uh, she does light up the room. Um, and, you know, I, I, I also think, you know, her, her skill and technique doesn't come across on, you know, on YouTube or TV, um, mm. extremely fast, uh, you know, obviously superb backhand. Um, oh my God, this is, this is really, this is, this is going to get me in a lot of trouble. 
I gotta, I, I, can I get back to you on that one? I gotta think about that. You can. Um, I, we can, I, we can I, move I, I feel like she is so fast, so close to the table. Um, it, it will have to be something, um, something to do with like martial arts, like Bruce Lee, you know? Oh, like, what about Michelle Yeoh? Yeah, Michelle I was Yeoh thinking be Michelle perfect, Yeoh. Right? Because yeah, because Michelle it, Yeoh has a, and you know what? I, I feel like Lily would be pretty flattered with that as well. I've given you a helping hand there. Yeah, I <laughs> um, thought about Michelle Yeoh at Crouching Tiger, for example, but I didn't want to be too, um, you know, too cliche. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but, Michelle Yeoh. Michelle, Michelle, yeah, she has great presence too. Really. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good one. All right, cool. Thank well, you. Well, that's a good way to. That's a good way to round things. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Amy Wong, Matt Damon. I love it. Oh, my God. Um, okay, we're going to move on from this. I don't want you to get too stressed out. That's all right. Um, <laughs> all right, so um, the, we, we've touched a little bit on, like, that elitism and that that uh, that kind of barrier to entry for, um, for table tennis players, for recreational people. Um, and you've talked also a little bit about the social media side as well. Um, now, obviously, like, you're probably not – directly involved in like all of the social media posting because there's a shit ton going on like ping pot is posting like crazy and there's so much variety but one of the things that i like about it is that it breaks away from this mold of posting about table tennis is always like great points it's always like high level stuff and i feel like the environment in the content for ping pod like being in the pods kind of makes people like feel more relaxed about it. It's not like, oh, wow, like this is some high level training center, but you know, that's a, a miles away from me. Um, but also like just these tutorials and the coaches having fun and you're just showing like regular players who are showing up to have fun. And I, I feel like it's really developed like a personality of its own. Um, I don't even know where I was going with the question. It's just become a passing comment. Um, how important do you think the digital strategy is when it comes to promoting ping pod and trying to spread, I mean, you have, you know, large email lists and the content's obviously become really important for you guys, but when you look at the content and you go, okay, you know, this is a tutorial that's literally teaching somebody something that a professional table dance player would probably go, it's like quite a mundane tutorial, but it relates perfectly to the people that you're trying to target? Yeah. Yeah, again, great question. Uh, you're, you're right. We have, we post, you know, great points from all the players that you just listed, you know, that are all Pink Pot sponsored. Uh, but we also do, like, how do you hold your racket, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, as, as easy as that. And then we have a lot of user-generated stuff, too. And... Uh, one of the things that I mentioned before oh, the was the replay uh, button. Yeah, please. The replay <laughs> I, I don't know button. why. Exactly. I'm asking this. Yeah. 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 No. I mean, and and that that question is is exactly answered by that. So we have uh, we inside all of our pods we have a replay button that's next to uh, the table, and when you have a cool shot, you go over and press the button, and then that replay of that of that point, not just a shot, that point will immediately uh, be in your profile and we'll email it to you afterwards. And in a couple of weeks, we're actually going to have it on the screens in real time, right? I you can that. see it. So you can use it as bar, right? Like, did it hit the edge? Did it not? Did it hit the net? All nice. of that. You can do it like too. that. The other one is that people, I don't know, you know, I'm, you know, Ben, ben also <laughs> says this. He says, like, you know, never go short narcissism, right? People love to see themselves play, right? And when you have a cool yeah. shot, I, I remember when I was at, you know, a different place, I'm like, I hit a shot in this day and age, everybody's on the phone, you know, people don't even watch you anymore. If you have a group of people, I'm like, did you see this? And, and, and people are like, no. And then nobody saw it, right? Except the opponent, maybe, and they may not have even paid attention. And it's like these moments are lost forever, right? Yeah. And yeah, so yeah. unless you put up a you know tripod and all of that, like so so out of the gate, this idea of the replays was really important to us. And um, you know, believe it or not, we ended up being able to file for a patent for that because it's actually user triggered, right? The people playing 
and being filmed are triggering what should be the replay. And what's happened now is that we're selling, and I say selling because we charge 50 cents for it, but only really because, first of all, there's obviously some costs related to hosting and transactions and mm. all of that. But the of other course. thing is yeah. we don't want people to spam us, right? If it's 100% free, people are just clicking it all right. the time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and we've yeah. had that, trust me, like kids and all of that. So, so, but we know like people, like we sell tens of thousands of those every month and people love seeing themselves play. Not only is it a cool point, but also a funny point, right? We actually have a channel on it. We have a community Slack. If you, if you want to join it, we have like three or 4,000 people. I on do. There I now. didn't know about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's super cool. There's a channel in there, best replays. And then there's a channel of best funny replays. Right. And so one thing that has happened is that people press the button when someone gets hit in the eye or stumbles over something or totally whiffs the ball. And that is the thing that you're talking about, which is like, again, it's kind of, um, you know, it kind of bridges the gap between people who are only pressing it because it's an amazing, you know, banana flip or, uh, you know, and to everybody, what is amazing to them is what's amazing to them. And, yeah. and by uh, by being able to produce these replays, right? We we basically create user generated content, right? It's yeah. our players. And it's relatable. It's relatable as exactly. well. I mean, this is the this is the big thing. Like, how can a normal person on the street that just plays, you know, maybe they grew up playing in their garage, how can they relate to like Ma Long? They can't. Exactly. They can be like, wow, this is amazing. But yep. you know, if you show a video of someone like whiffing a ball like five five times or something, so the first people are going to comment and be like, that that's me. That's me too. Yeah. Like, that's totally me. I would, I would be the one to do that in the club. That's right. And it makes it less intimidating and it makes people feel like, Oh, I could play there for sure. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, we have the gamut and most of, you know, most of them are not like necessarily rollers or, you know, any kind of crazy points, but yeah, um, cool. yeah that that's part of the strategy. I mean, since you asked about digital and all of that and, you know, our tech stack, um, we've been asked a lot since we started uh, whether other people could use our tech stack. And so we actually, and this is probably a good place, um, sorry, I'm diverging a little bit here, but good place to mention that, you know, we actually um, have a second business line called Pod Play, where we essentially right. took yeah. everything that we built inside of PingPod, all of the tech, the hardware, the software, all of that, the autonomous part, and, you know, becomes portable into other sports and other venues, right? Pickleball, for example, yeah. um, you know, we, we, we all love table tennis, of course, but like any kind of racket sport is awesome, right? Um, there's a lot of hype around pickleball right now, a lot of people building and, uh, you know, we're licensing our technology to uh, some of these, you know, these venues, for example, City Pickle here in New York and, and so forth. Right, which is huge, um, yeah. Yeah, no, it's great. It's yeah. it's great for the business, of course. But like it all started with, you know, ping pong, right? And other people want to be like, wait, how do you do that? You know, not just the scoreboard. We have a scoreboard too, but not just the the, uh, the replay and the scoreboard, but also like how do you set your club up to be totally autonomous? And so people right. can um, can kind of buy this off the shelf. And it's been it's really kind of taken off like gangbusters. It's a little bit crazy. Um, but anyway, side point. Um, um, there's one more thing that I wanted to touch on. Um, one of the things that I also think has set you apart is the way that you've set up your coaching staff. Because when you look at a typ typical table tennis club, this is like ping pong coaching staff is not something you would typically see in like an elite table tennis club. So you have like a whole range and you have people who uh, you know, they might not be like the highest, highest level coaches, but they're so relatable to people that will walk in off the street and people have an amazing time. They learn the basic techniques. And I've, I've, it was like one area in the beginning, I was just like, it's a very, like, very interesting strategy. And I wonder where they're going with it. But over time, you really start to understand if you look at other table tennis clubs, like if you take a 2700 level Chinese coach, and a walk-in that just wants to learn how to play table tennis. There's such a huge disconnect there. And I think there's like this whole mentality around 
I mean, I have so many opinions about this and there is going to be another podcast on it at a later date, but the ideas of what a good coach are in the US and worldwide are often incredibly broken. So, yeah. I mean, obviously this is something that you and Ernesto probably talked about a lot and you're the, the, the whole team talked about, but what was that philosophy where you said, hey, let's do something different. Let's get relatable people, you know, regardless of what their playing level is, if they can teach people, let's get them in our pods. Yeah. You know, by just, uh, for, by you asking this question, um, like it makes me feel like you really understand what we're trying to do. Um, it's, it's really great coming from you. I know, I mean, you are a high level coach, right. And, uh, and, and there's a lot Sometimes. of opinions on, <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, no, but seriously, I mean, you would be at the very top level, of, you know, our coaching uh, staff, um, but there are a lot of opinions and a lot of snobbery around like, oh my God, you're not, you know, 2300, 2400 yeah. above, you know, can't really be coaching anybody. And I think that's been holding the sport back. It's the same reason why the club system right. is kind of, you know, broken in a way. And so what we've tried to do is, you know, we, we try to make coaching more accessible from both directions, from the customer point of view, as well as the coach's point of view. Right. Hmm. So we've allowed coaches to become coaches. who don't necessarily have all the accolades, right. In the past, you had to have a name or accolades or a special, you know, rating or whatever. Um, not, now you also said we have a range, like, don't get me wrong. We have tons of incredible high level coaches, yes, you know, right, number of yeah. Olympians, you know, yeah. uh, 2,700, you know, former plus frankly, uh, but frankly, you don't really need an Olympian to teach you the basics. Right. And that yeah. in itself is intimidating. And the Olympians are also going to be more expensive. Right. So what we did is essentially went downstream on purpose, right. In terms of downstream, in terms of skill level, and then you open a door for, you know, people who are awesome coaches, but maybe didn't, weren't on the national team. Right. And, mm. and you're, you're hundred percent right. I think this is the direction that you, you, you're thinking, or you are indicating, which is, uh, just because someone has a high level doesn't mean they're a great coach, right? With Ernesto, that's the case, but that's because he's a great coach first and foremost, and he mm. happened to have been a fantastic player. Right. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the point from a coach's point of view. And then additionally, we also solved the scheduling issue, right? We built software that allows the coaches to have a dashboard where the coaches can put in their availability and the customer can then pick the coach and the table at the same time, make it super easy, right? right? It lines everything up and then, you know, the coach gets a ping, they decide, uh, they, they say accept and, you know, off they go. And we have tons and tons of like people that come from the street and be like, okay, I can get someone that's a club coach, right? They're also, you know, more, they're, you know, starting at uh, 50 bucks an hour, right? Yeah. It's, uh, and then we even have this concept of sort of getting a hitting partner, right? For those you essentially get, um, you know, you don't, you don't pay anything. And, you know, we, 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 we tried that for a little bit, but the whole idea is like, yeah, you get going all the way down to someone like teaching, you know, showing me the ropes. Right. And, and that on the app side, it's all integrated with the booking and, you know, getting, getting a table or going to an event or whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that our coaching coach onboarding process isn't rigorous, right? We're still very yeah. rigorous because we want yeah. people to be good coaches first and foremost. Yeah. And so here I should mention, you know, Matilda Ekholm, I'm, I'm, I know, you know, Mati very well, but Mati, uh, is a director of coaching. She's, incredible um you know all kinds of all kinds of ways i uh, i remember when i first saw her she came to uh, to watch us build the first pot she came to new york right uh during that time and i was just like kind of starstruck i'm like oh my god matilda I, you know i was like <laughs> i was uh because you know i've been i've been watching her play and um you know she's been around for for a long time she, um and she's very, very bright, right? Imagine you're a professional athlete for 25 years, and then you go to a startup, a venture funded startup, right? And have to build and create a department with all of the things that yeah. go with it. Yeah. So she's really, um, anyway, uh, sorry, too, too crazy, um, too, too, uh, too far off topic here. But Matilda makes, uh, makes sure that all the coaches 
have the background, you know, our background check, follow what we yeah. call the ping pod way. We have a series of videos internally that, you know, people have to go through essentially a process that the coaches have to go through for onboarding. Uh, and so, she created all of that. Ultimately, she has a final say in who, who gets onboarded. But I mean, we go as far down to like, as like say 1200, 1300 level to be like kids coaches or beginners coaches, right? Mm. Um, and it like, you know, if you're a casual player, like you said, you don't need to be coached by a 2700 level coach. Yeah. Uh, and so you're right. That's, that's, that's been something that we have done on purpose and ultimately been, been able to onboard, you know, we're, I think we have over a hundred coaches now, um, across all of the pods and the coaches love it too. We give them a lot of range and, you know, they're in charge mm. of their own of their own schedule and all of that. And they get paid out right away. All the tech is set up in a you know, super easy way. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a great question. And that's definitely been done on purpose. And, and the same fundamental theme applies here. Like, don't be elitist. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good way to, good way to kind of wrap things up as like the, the theme of the podcast. Um, Max, thanks a, a, really a lot for this. Um, as I said before, like when PingPod first launched is, I mean, it's the same with everything. I mean, Major League Table Tennis is kind of in the same space, like new things launch and you start to think about them and, and you think, okay, you know, is this going to work or does this make sense or does that make sense? But I feel like PingPod is one of those things that the more I've started to understand about it. And honestly, I think you all are in the same boat um, where once they really started to understand how impressive the tech was behind this, the market that this was like intentionally going after. Um, I think people just become significantly more interested and um, really get behind it more. Um, so I think this podcast has been really great um, to help people understand um, how PingPod has, has kind of become a, like a, a catalyst for that journey from recreational to pro. And that kind of like ties everything up really nicely. So I um, really appreciate you taking some time to come on and talk some smash, but not too much. <laughs> yeah, no, Matt, appreciate it. Uh, also, just by looking through your questions, like I, I can see that you have made that journey as well. It's like, well, what is this? This isn't, you know, and ultimately yeah. being open to having this new system. You know, we have 75 or 80,000 customers now. It's crazy. It's huge. A thousand of those were probably playing regularly before. And the 79,000 yeah. that we added are now new people in new that people. big funnel. Right. right. And yes. it's just, you know, per location, just going to keep increasing. So we're super happy and very, very grateful uh, to those folks, right, that have given us a chance. Our community is everything. Uh, you know, these are, again, these are cliche kind of phrases, but we truly, truly believe that, right? Like I, I worked in finance and did all kinds of meaningless things, but this is the thing that blows my hair back, right? And, and getting people into becoming an addict, like, like I am. A Perfect. Good, good addict. Yeah, in a good way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks very much, Max. Awesome, Matt. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me on.